Uh, good morning, everybody. I am Zenobia, and I am the CEO for the Kent Chamber of Commerce. On behalf of myself and the board of directors, we'd like to welcome you to COVID-19, a conversation with City Hall edition. This program is sponsored by our board member, Julia Atwood, Managing Director at Shannon and Associates. Julia said it is an honor to sponsor this Kent Chamber event. Shannon and Associates is proud to be a part of the Kent community for over 70 years. They are a full service CPA and consulting firm teaming with successful businesses and individuals throughout the Puget Sound region. Partnering with Shannon and Associates means you will receive effective business strategies and consulting services encompassing everything from industry specific advice, tax, audit, fraud prevention, business valuations, mergers and acquisitions, and a wide range of other compliance and consulting services. They also have a special COVID-19 resource center on their website and are currently helping many clients navigate through all the tax and economic assistance available. You can find the link in the chat room. So I just wanna thank Shannon and Associates for their continued commitment to the community and the chamber. This program is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook by South King Media. South King Media hosts a variety of blogs and websites, one of which is I Love Kent. We wanna also thank South King Media. All participants at this time have been placed on mute and all questions should be placed in the chat, either to everyone or directly to Zenobia. I'd like to take a minute before we begin to recognize the elected officials that we have on the line. I see we have Dr. Watts, Kent School District Superintendent. We have Mayor of Covington, Jeff Wagner. We have Council Member Zandria Michaud and Council Member Bill Boyce. Did I miss anyone on the line? We got the Mayor Kent. Oh, <laughs> imagine that, Zenobia. Yes, and of course we have. Uh, the wonderful Dana Rao, uh, Mayor of Kent, who I was going to introduce because she is our guest speaker today. Any other Tina elected Warwa. officials? Uh, Tina Warwa, state rep from the 33rd. Thank you for joining, Tina. All right. Well, at this time, I'd like to welcome our guest speakers. We have our Mayor, Dana Rao, along with Economic Development Team, Michelle Wilmot, Michelle Wilmot and Bill Ellis. So hello. You guys can go ahead and unmute yourselves. So thank you guys for taking time to speak with the business community today. We definitely appreciate your leadership during this crisis and are interested uh, in all of the updates that you have for us. So uh, Mayor, we can begin with you if you'd like. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Appreciate you for taking, taking the time to come um, and let us um, provide you with the opportunity to kind of update what, what's happening here at City Hall and throughout the city, and um, more importantly, the work that's being done to help our business community um, through all of this. So really high level, I will start with um, Tuesday, we announced um, to our city council um, after many levels of conversation, um, what amounted to about a $15.7 million uh, budget cut. So remember our general funds about 110 million. So it's a significant, a significant cut. Um, our major funding sources are sales tax and um, sales tax, property tax, and our business and occupation tax, as well as things like gas tax. And so in every single one of those categories, we're seeing a reduction in revenue. Um, we're seeing a reduction in our camera funds, um, fines, our courts not been operating. So um, every major revenue source that the city has, has, has gone down. Um, we announced that we are um, losing 11 city employees as a result of this. Um, eight of them are being laid off and there are three early retirements uh, that are happening as a result of these cuts. And then we also um, announced that our rec division in our parks department, because of the stay home, stay healthy order and the fact that we've got, um, there's a lot of uncertainty around dates of when things will be allowed, what will actually be allowed. We um, are canceling nearly all of our summer programming. So things like Splash, the Lions announced they are um, not going to be holding cornucopia days. So we won't be doing the 5K run. Um, all of our children's programs, um, both youth and adult sports leagues, all of those kind of things are happening. So in our rec division, we furloughed a majority of those employees um, and looking at a September 1 date for bringing them back. 
Um, we also um, were required to make some, uh, we did not cut any police officer positions, but we did freeze the hiring of five of them. That will continue to be the main priority and when the economy returns to bring those positions back to being available. Um, but that is that is kind of where we're at at this point. Uh, Bill and Michelle have a, a really good presentation on the different things that are happening out there as resources for the business community, what the city's doing, um, programs that the county has to offer as well as the state. Um, we will be able to um, sort of tease up a program that we've got coming. I'm excited about um, some, a way to um, directly financially support our business community. Uh, I also had a conversation with um, Congressman Adam Smith this morning and um, did address some concerns around business funding there. So um, he, he gave me a heads up that they are trying to work through some of the issues with especially the PPP loans, those kinds of things. Um, so I would encourage if, um, and Zenovia, you and I can have this conversation offline or if there's business owners that have those um, concerns. I know I heard one from one this morning that um, I've got a little bit more information on that that I can share. So I think with that, um, it's probably a good time to turn it over to Bill and Michelle to sort of walk through all of the things that are happening in this arena. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, Michelle, if you're on the line, I, I'm hoping you can share your screen and everyone will be able to see the PowerPoint. Absolutely, let me get going on that. Okay. Some of the information I'm presenting is, is basically what we were anticipating was gonna happen. Some of the things that uh, uh, we ended up spending most of our time on in the first 30 days. And then as Mayor Ralph said, I'm teasing out some of the things that are to um, come over the next 30 days. Uh, as we get more of that resource from the CARES Act down to the municipal level, um, a lot of the sort of planning and coordination discussions that I've, I've been engaged in will be now uh, becoming more tangible as we actually have access to funds to uh, put in the hands of businesses. So I see the screen is up now. Um, let me know if anyone else has any issue with seeing it. Okay, great. Uh, Michelle, if you can advance the slide, uh, I'll get going. <laughs> okay. So um, bear with me, I'm gonna restate what's probably the painfully obvious right now that this is an unprecedented uh, national job loss situation. Uh, I think the report is today 38.6 million people are now unemployed. Next slide, please. Um, the numbers for this week are getting better, but that's relative to uh, what's been uh, a nightmare. Uh, what you've seen in just the first two weeks was basically all the jobs lost in the Great Recession uh, in terms of weekly unemployment insurance stacked up in just a couple of weeks. Uh, actually, Michelle, if you go to the previous slide, I just wanna make one more point about this. Uh, previous slide. So um, uh, yeah, you see the recession bar there in the light blue compared to those two orange lines. That, those are equivalent. So uh, if you go forward again, um, two more. One more, please. Yeah. Uh, so going back as lo long as we, oh, previous. <laughs> as long as we've had this information, uh, uh, we've collected this data uh, from the Department of Labor. Um, going back to the 1960s, you can see that little bar below 1 million each week. And then uh, just recently, that one spike on the far right of yours, it's, it's quite literally off the charts. And we, we risk depression, although I think the U.S. Treasury has gotten a handle on some of the financial uh, uh, catastrophe elements. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the things I looked at early on was I compared sort of the industry of Kent, our makeup, uh, and seeing uh, who would be, how many of our jobs were uh, impacted directly by the essential orders. It was, a, it was a guesstimate based upon what the Fed Reserve did at the time. And what I came up with, 60% of the jobs were in some risk of layoff. Not that we were going to have 60% unemployed, but uh, to make the point compared to the Fed of uh, St. Louis's projection that 46% of the jobs were nationally high at risk, our business mix skewed to be more at risk of uh, layoffs uh, because of the number of uh, employees we have in restaurants, bars, apparel, hotels, furniture, other types of retail, as well as wholesale, manufacturing, construction, basically industries where you cannot telework. Uh, we have a, a, a a workforce in the business space that uh, needs to work in close quarters. So um, going back to early April to now, has that borne out? Um, well, next slide, please, Michelle. What we heard, again, this is April 1 survey information here of uh, 307 respondents of uh, Kent businesses. We have another survey out there now that's regional 
that we're helping to push. And I just want to thank Michelle for putting out those weekly emails of, through the mayor's office to 4,000 Kent businesses where we're trying to set out resources. We've been encouraging people to take this survey, uh, partly because we didn't want to uh, create a separate survey and duplicate efforts or create confusion amongst all the different surveys and uh, you know offers for help and this about SBA and this, and we didn't want to add to that noise, but at the same time, we feel uh, strongly that it's important to know what's going on out there uh, more than ever. And um, uh, having Kent specific information is important. So uh, we're pulling out uh, what we can on Kent. Uh, uh, we're, um, even though we're in a bit of a financial problem, we've been passing the hat with our neighbors and uh, uh, with Green River uh, college to do some additional uh, analysis of uh, second and third rounds of this uh, uh, survey that's being pushed out on a monthly basis. So I don't have the most recent response, but even back on April 1, you can see uh, two thirds of our businesses were already thinking about layoffs or, or having difficulty with rent. Uh, that's basically to distill down all the information you hear, see here. Those are the two highlights, uh, two headlines that I took away. And on the business concerns, uh, lack of cash reserves was the number number one issue, uh, going to why putting cash in the, in the hands of a business owner was such an immediate interest of the Small Business Administration, which is now a very famous agency, wasn't before. Um, I think in the, um, if I get this right, on the first day that the EIDL, that's the Emergency Disaster Loans, were made available in the state of California, they had as many applications from that state in one day than they usually get from the United States as a whole uh, over a course of a year from hurricanes, tornadoes, et cetera. Uh, and and it, it got worse from there. So there was a lot of uh, impact early on on the small business development centers, on banks, uh, trying to figure out how to process that information. Uh, there were mistakes made. I, I, I feel like it's gotten somewhat better, although a lot of people were missed. Uh, it's, it's gotten better in my discussions with uh, uh, folks who are on those front lines of business assistance uh, because of uh, uh, the number of applications have gone down and they haven't run out of the second tranche yet. But um, there's still a lot of issues with uh, who can access those funds and I think that's something that we're thinking just again to tease ahead. Uh, how, how do we get cash in the hands of a business is, is really um, the most pressing need. Uh, next slide please. Uh, why is that? Uh, here's some information kind of just graphically illustrating how much uh, a month or two months worth of lost revenue. This is probably, again, forgive me for a lot of you on the phone, uh, not surprising information at all uh, that this has been like a hurricane that last months. And, uh, uh, and as a result, you know, having to run through your cash reserves and, and, and just stays uh, well, who can who can bear with that? And I think that's why you know we see restaurants there on the bottom. A typical restaurant in the United States has 16 days of cash reserves. Maybe a high tech service company, 33 days. Uh, next slide. If you could advance the slide, please. Did you see it, Bill? Yes. Okay. Okay, it's gotten uh, so the spread of cash on hand uh, varies by industry. So. Uh, all small businesses on average have about, uh, uh, you see there in the highlighted sort of on the, towards the left and gray, uh, they have about $12,000 uh, cash reserve. Um, maybe some high tech manufacturing now firm has a lot more, some may have less, but typically they have even less than that. That's an, that's an average. So this kind of shows the spread by industry uh, with uh, personal services, repair and maintenance, retail, uh, being amongst uh, those with the least amount of uh, cash reserve on hand. So when the governor's office announced that $5 million in uh, uh, grants where they repurposed their strategic reserve funds that are usually used for business attraction from other states, the small businesses, that's why they really focused in on those micro enterprises and those types of businesses and, and who they wanted those uh, monies to go to. They later uh, increased the number of, uh, um, uh, increased the number of award from $5 million to $10 million. But really all of that was a drop in the bucket in terms of need. I think for King County, they had something like 9,000 applications in the first hour that was announced, but the ADO for King County only could award 30 to 60 uh, businesses. So they farmed out those grants to all the various cities, uh, but it, it far outstripped the need. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I think of all the industries that are exposed to this, including aerospace, um, uh, not that it's a contest, but I think uh, 
one of the one of the worst industries, uh, one of the industries most impacted the worst would be restaurant, clearly. Um, and uh, one of the parts of this catastrophe that is terribly sad, uh, the Washington Hospitality Association is projecting that four out of five restaurants will never reopen. Uh, and that's a very large number of employees. Um, take out and delivery, uh, we're going to talk in a moment here about how we're trying to support that um, with full knowledge that isn't enough. And we're looking forward to the time when uh, some of the restaurants, we've been talking to Kent Downtown Partnership on a regular basis, uh, trying to identify restaurants in the downtown that can open up outdoors, how do we make available sidewalks or parking stalls for those restaurants that want to have that increased uh, capacity outside. But in the meantime, we've been, we've been focusing on takeout just because it's some revenue and, and going back to that earlier slide with the 16 days of cash reserves is something, but um, next slide, please. Um, actually, I'm going to have Michelle, if you don't mind just expanding on some of these elements here. I know you've been working on a lot of this directly. Absolutely. Um, thanks to the chamber and the KDP and some of the individual restaurateurs on this call. Um, we have been working really hard with our teammates at JRay, which is our PR firm we've had on hand to help us um, populate and uh, content on our Visit Kent website, as well as our Visit Kent uh, social media platforms. We've got Facebook and Instagram there. But what we've been looking at trying to do is supporting our restaurant community who is struggling mightily is to really highlight those that are um, hanging on by the skin of their teeth at the moment. Um, we have um, been doing some interviews with some restaurateurs so we can promote those on social media. Um, we've been looking at virtual food pairings, um, sharing recipes where people can do some of these things at home. It's been amazing the um, creative ideas some of these restaurateurs have and um, we're trying to promote those to support them the best we can. Uh, thanks to the Schaefer's at I Love Kent. Uh, they helped us create an online restaurant directory. Hopefully you've all seen that. Once it was created, I shared that amongst our partners and across the community the best I could. Um, same with folks at Kent Station. They helped us make sure that um, the restaurants that were open there are populated. And um, secondly, uh, the, the city of Seattle actually put together a regional restaurant map. It originally started to be just for Seattle. And given the crisis in restaurant industry across the board, um, they actually reached out to other cities and have provided this service for free. Um, so restaurants could add themselves to the Puget Sound small business restaurant map. It spans businesses from the north end of King County all the way down into um, Pierce County. Um, so we've, we've done uh, the best we could to make sure people were aware of this opportunity and um, have them included there as well. Um, <clears throat> what's been happening, which has been really great to see in spite of this crisis is people have um, really um, sort of blurred their municipal boundary lines. And um, we've, we've been asked to partner on other, other campaigns that are happening around us as well. Um, the Seattle Southside Chamber of Commerce actually invited us to be part of their Keep Calm and Carry Out program, which is just a social media push to make sure that we are promoting those restaurants that are open. Um, what we've got included there is our own Stay Local, Stay Kent program, which was created by, by Jay Ray once again. Um, another program, which I'll show you some images here on the next slide, but um, the Save Local um, program is something that our friends at the city of Tequila um, have put together. They've got lodging tax dollars to provide this program where um, what it is is we can they're looking to push the sale of gift cards and experiences to get cash in the door now for um, use later. Um, th that program is being featured all over King County as well. And um, I have worked with the chamber and the KDP and others to make sure that um, our, our businesses are participating in all of these programs. I know it's a lot of different programs, but there's so many sources of for information. We want to make sure we're everywhere we can be in 
this really challenging time. Um, part of the work we've been doing in the restaurant community too is to recruit participation in some of the hospitality webinars that are being hosted. We actually worked um, to get um, all of the restaurateurs at Kent Station and up at Marketplace at Lake Meridian and um, through the chamber and KDP as well to participate in some of these webinars that are being hosted by industry professionals just so we can um, not have to reinvent the wheel um, but make sure that everybody has got the same access to information so um, we've had some great participation in those and there's some really interesting information coming out as I'm sure some of the restaurant tours on this call could attest to. Um, I'm just going to move to the next slide. Um, hopefully these look familiar to you. Um, this keep calm carry out image is, is what is being promoted by the Seattle Southside Chamber as well as our own. And then the saving local program is the one I mentioned with the city of Tequila who has opened this program up across municipal boundaries to include any and all businesses in the county to participate. It's free to list your business offering on there. So um, you can go to that website and add your business deal. That's all you've got to do. It's easy and free and you will be promoted on various um, social media platforms. And this is- um, Thanks, Michelle. I would just say on the uh, Tukwila, Piece. Uh, the, the Tukwila Lodging Tax Group has been very generous, I think, and partly because they understand um, how the economy works, where businesses in the Kent Valley end up going to the South Center uh, and vice versa. And uh, uh, they've been very generous about that. And they've, they had a large cash reserve going into this. Uh, I think their lodging tax had about uh, 1.6 million reserve. Um, they have a lot more hotels relative to Kent. So uh, they, they open that up to us and to other cities throughout King County, other counties on the weekly calls that we participate on with maybe 100 economic development manager, managers across the region, uh, or, you know, and by the region, I mean Puget Sound, uh, are, are, you know, eager to join with that. So uh, our, our early efforts were really focused on uh, mitigation, uh, but this is a rolling crisis. And uh, uh, next slide, please, Michelle. Um, it has a lot of different facets to it. Um, so uh, as Michelle's been doing, uh, uh, and hopefully a lot of you've seen emails, we're, we're always trying to search for other grant opportunities and, uh, and set those out as they've become available. Unfortunately, some of them like the plate fund ran out with that within an hour. Uh, the philanthropic resources are, are fast and furious in the beginning, but I think they're starting to tap out as uh, people realized uh, it was kind of like um, draining the ocean, trying to <laughs> trying to uh, get enough grant funding out there. Next slide, please. Um, the hotel industry as well. Uh, we've heard uh, locally uh, a large reduction in overnight stays. Um, I, I, what I do hope, and uh, you know, I hope this isn't presumptuous, is that. Uh, because we are a business travel location with a lot of people that need to travel to business locations that we will do better than say a leisure destination location in terms of recovering some of those hotel stays that as businesses reopen the business travel stay will come with that. Uh, whereas maybe the discretionary visit to Las Vegas or the uh, convention center uh, type of hotel night stay might recover later. So that might be an advantage for us. Uh, next slide please. Uh, so we've been putting out those travel advisories, doing all the type of messaging that is important uh, at this time uh, on the uh, travel front. Next slide. And uh, we've been pushing uh, with our partners at Green River College as well as uh, Highline College. Uh, we've been talking out there about the SBA and the importance of that. Thank you. Next slide. I'm not going to cover the SBA uh, in, in detail now because hopefully that's something that everyone is uh, uh, somewhat steeped in at this point, but um, the CARES Act uh, was immensely important, I think, in terms of stabilizing the free fall uh, of the economy. And what we're really looking at now, just now, is some of the funds that were made available in that are now making their way through the processes where the city can actually uh, put them out themselves. So there's additional funding for the community development block grants. We as an entitlement city are looking at uh, some of that funding, $670,000 for business assistance. And then there's uh, a surge of funding for US Economic Development Administration grants. I just uh, spoke this morning with uh, uh, Matt Swenson at uh, Green River College, their grant administration 
uh, uh, staffer about uh, grant applications that maybe the college and city could support with other partners uh, to take advantage of that, those additional funds. I've been in close communication the last uh, month and a half uh, with the Manufacturing Extension uh, Partnership, which is Impact Washington in the state. Um, they got an additional $1.2 million. Uh, what they've been really focused on is uh, creating free pro bono assessments of how to reopen your facility, your factory uh, safely. Uh, there's no state certification at this time, but there is uh, a whole lot of information, a lot of people hard at work at producing uh, reams of assessments, uh, checklists, uh, best practices, and then what they will do is they'll deploy their staff uh, at no cost to a manufacturer. And by deploy, I mean someone will walk the factory uh, on FaceTime on a cell phone and take a look at it. Uh, so, and then basically make suggestions. Uh, so what we've been brainstorming with them is to make sort of a manufacturing reoper, reopening care package. And uh, we've been working with our partners at AJAC, which is a local training center. It has a local training center in Kent that we got started. And now we're looking to uh, re-up funding using Port of Seattle dollars again this year, uh, how we can actually uh, speed resources to the employer through subsidized wage training uh, uh, and help some of the more vulnerable workers to layoffs and some of the more vulnerable workers get OSHA and other types of training uh, at no cost to the employer and then actually subsidize their wages, which would actually produce, create an inducement or incentive to rehire back some of those dislocated workers. Um, so we're looking at that and that's something we're trying to leverage off, off of the outreach dollar of uh, Impact Washington. And then if there's other things that we can put in that care package, uh, we've been talking to partners about the other partners about that as well, including CAMPS, the Center for Advanced Manufacturing Puget Sound. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so really important entities right now, uh, uh, sort of I see them as the frontline workers of this disaster, uh, is the community development financial institutions. Uh, Business Impact Northwest, if you haven't heard of them already, they work in White Center. Uh, you might know of their work around Startup 425 on the east side. Um, they're a smaller outfit, but they do uh, a variety of loan support. Uh, they've been a big SBA technical advisory group for businesses. Um, they created some great resources that we've been putting out there in emails on the city's webpage and trying to link everywhere we can uh, to their COVID-19 business support. Um, they have a lot of referral partners. Uh, I've been talking to their uh, executive director more recently just about some of the CDBG dollars that we're receiving and how we can partner that with them. Uh, for the long haul. I'm also having a similar conversation right now with Craft 3, which is all over the Pacific Northwest and has major offices around here. Uh, they have a King County outreach person who uh, was under contract to work uh, later this year for King, King County's Communities of Opportunity program uh, to provide a, a, business a business assistance strategy to prevent uh, gentrification of dislocated businesses in, in Kent and Auburn. Uh, I think maybe the mission's changing a little bit because uh, that was contracted prior to uh, uh, COVID-19 hitting. And uh, a lot of our discussions right now have been about some of the philanthropic work that they've done uh, for JP Morgan and others to get uh, grant dollars out there, uh, not just technical assistance, but uh, uh, direct granting. And uh, they've also done some loan programs that are uh, really important. Um, I would say that's another sort of mid to long range conversation with them as we are looking at EDA uh, granting opportunity as a way of creating a revolving loan fund. They would be a technical uh, agency that would be really important to administrating that fund. It's not something that a city could do on its own. We don't have underwriting. Uh, until the attorney general made a memo clear uh, April 6th, uh, cities in Washington never really thought they had the power to make direct grants or direct loans. But in this emergency, a lot of the CARES Act funding is now being allowed to go for direct grants and direct loans to businesses. Uh, That's kind of an historic memo from the Attorney General of the state of Washington and uh, has kind of set off a whole series of conversations over the last uh, four weeks amongst uh, cities and amongst each other about trying to position themselves to, uh, to, do, to do well by those funds and have them uh, be most effective. Um, so we're kind of still in those early planning stages, I would say, uh, but uh, uh, trying to get ready for the task of, of, of sending out funds. I will say I've worked uh, on a CDBG funded, a revolving loan fund for the state of Oregon where they never had uh, such strict, uh, such restrictions, I would say, over government making uh, loans uh, and creating job creation programs. Uh, it was hugely successful over a period of decades. Um, and, and standing up whole new industries like the craft beer industry in, in Eugene, Oregon. 
Um, so having that here would be immensely exciting. Uh, and I think these are some of the types of organizations that would be really essential for us to partner with uh, in order to undertake that because it does take a lot of specialized staffing. Next slide, please. Um, we've pushed out, we've talked to others about uh, philanthropic help for the small business community. Uh, All in Seattle is a Seattle Foundation a program that uh, raised $27 million early, early. Unfortunately, I would say, you know, we tried to push that out to Kent businesses and, and there was a lot of confusion early on if Kent businesses were eligible and they were. And by that time, by the time the confusion was overridden in a few cases of businesses, they were waitlisted before the funding ran out. So. Um, I know that there have been other discussions about creating other philanthropic front funds outside of Seattle that don't have the name Seattle that reduce confusion. So that's something where, uh, next slide please, uh, we, we really need to think about. Um, so another, just a statement here. Uh, so a lot of our early discussion was about sort of how do we get creative in doing marketing online? How do we uh, push and promote the federal programs for uh, stopping uh, uh, the bleeding, so to speak, in terms of an, uh, idle loans and uh, PPP. Um, but what are we going to be faced with over the long run here? Are we going to have a V-shaped recovery? You might have heard that where we dive down and then we shoot right back up the moment we open. Do we have this sort of long languishing in the, in the bottom here in the U? Is it an L where we just reached a new low and, and, and fear of COVID kind of just dampens economic activity forever forward? Is it a W where we keep having spikes and outbreaks and keep going back indoors and that keeps uh, shutting down the economy over and over? Uh, so we keep going down and up and down and up or is it a Nike swoosh is where we kind of, we, we have this huge contraction in GDP, we go, all go backward, we all become poorer and then we slowly dig our way out. Um, nobody knows, I think that's clear, but I would say that there's a lot of variables and it's worth thinking about as we prepare ourselves for what comes next. While we are focused on trying to get some of the immediate cash that we receive out there to, to mitigate some of the immediate pain, it isn't start too soon to have begun planning for the recession period to come and what are the right tools that economic development, chambers of commerce and others need to have in their possession uh, to be thinking about how they support recovery. So next slide. Uh, we've done a lot of discussion. We try to keep in communication daily, weekly. Uh, with all of these variety of entities, some of which I already mentioned, like the impact of Washington. Next slide. Uh, Michelle keeps in contact with AFA and what's going on there in, in the PNWA. I, I've been talking to the camps director. Um, next slide. And of course, our, our friends here at the Kent Chamber and uh, Kent Downtown Partnership. Next slide. So um, we're probably the last county to be reopened here, the way things are going. Uh, but uh, one of the things that's really struck me, uh, even just yesterday, and uh, I hadn't planned to talk about this, but I think I, I should, uh, a lot of different cities are looking at what Challenge Seattle, which is a group uh, founded by uh, Governor Gregoire, um, had created uh, in terms of what are good operating procedures for businesses in the phases to come and then the brave new world we all enter into. Uh, they've produced these very detailed uh, new packets about that. And uh, uh, I know the city of Everett for them uh, have taken it on themselves to sort of simplify that and create a, a, a guidebook, a toolkit for to advise businesses. You should have your customers stand at markers at this distance from one another. And this is what temperature che checks look like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's kind of funny to me that it's falling to every city though, <laughs> because I think of as a, as a customer, that can be immensely confusing. And I think for businesses, it could be immensely confusing. If you're in Everett, you have a different experience than Bellevue, you have a different experience than say Auburn. Um, that's gonna help, that's gonna worsen the situation for the economic recovery at, at large. So uh, speaking to the slide here uh, up at the moment, uh, so the response to the next 30 days. So I'd say a lot of what I've been talking about in, in terms of what we've been doing looking backwards is just trying to create new communication, participation in some of the new telework forums, uh, the support we've we've offered to our allies at the SBDCs and CDFIs, not just direct technical assistance to the businesses, but just kind of given a lay of land of who's doing what, where, uh, and promotion of resources. Uh, so a lot of communication. But I think the next 30 days, and I think this is something I was just doing this morning, uh, is the first bullet there, is try to create a common technical assistance platform. We've been talking a lot with the Dean uh, at Green River College, uh, Diane Chen, uh, about this and she's uh, offered to help champion this. And the city of Bellevue um, just 
offered up today their uh, all their web development on the tool restart 425 which is a common platform for technical assistance on the east side uh, it's not that we don't have a lot of the same players working in south king county offering the same services but what we don't have is the same level of coordination and presentation to the business community and i think that's a real detriment to both the marketing of the, of the resources and the programs and it's a detriment to businesses because they spend a lot of time having to you know, surf around to find the same information. Having one web tool that uh, farms out the business and makes the referral that happens informally between agencies, but actually have that more streamlined is something that we'd like to have. And uh, uh, City of Bellevue was very generous this morning after spending you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars over a period of years in creating that, just uh, sent it by Dropbox into my email uh, this morning. So that's, that, that was nice of them. Um, we're trying to build capacity to offer and disperse funding from federal government uh, that will flow through the city. So Mayor Ralph alluded to that. I, I don't think we have a lot of details at this stage because we've just got confirmation yesterday afternoon or evening uh, that the funding would even be made available to us. Um, so, uh, but that hasn't prevented us from having at least a conversation at a city level about what are some of the legal issues at play there and how do we um, structure a program that aligns with what others have already done and trying to learn best practices from other states about some of their grant dispersal programs uh, from municipalities to uh, cities. We've heard a lot from uh, uh, Kirkland's experiences with the Google dollar funds and from the Seattle Chamber in terms of the governor's funds. And believe me, there's a lot of lessons learned about they, the people who administered those kind of regret not having given out the money, but how they advertised it and how they, they, they had to process through it. It was um, Sort of an overwhelming and somewhat emotional experience reading all the de uh, desperate applications and then uh, being delayed and, and, and trying to work through it all. So uh, we were trying to do it smarter uh, and learn from some of those very recent experiences. Um, and again, as I was trying to talk about with the uh, different um, curvatures of the recovery period, uh, how do we think strategically about diverting some of the money from the helicopter drop, which is the term of art for throwing money out the window of businesses to pay bills in this catastrophe uh, to start thinking about the recovery period that's that's starting to, to come up closer and, uh, uh, and and be strategic about having tools that last us through that recession period to help businesses for the long run. Next slide. So the local plan for the economic recovery, uh, I think I'm covering this uh, already a little bit. I'll just uh, jump around here. Um, next slide. Actually, I think I've covered this already actually. So we have a lot, uh, a lot of work ahead of us. I made mention of the Everett uh, CARES grant program and the Everett uh, toolkit, trying to learn from those lessons. Uh, we're looking at that toolkit, if there should be something similar given as advice uh, at the city level, although I'll, I'll open that up to this conversation to this group. Uh, you know, it's a little strange to me that uh, that is being done at a city level and not at a coordinated regional level and, and the impact on businesses that that might have if, if you're uh, on the pack highway and you have a different set of expectations on depending on what side of the road you're on. Next slide. Um, some of the ideas that are uh, sort of medium term beyond this mitigation, uh, you know, camps for years now, and, and Kent's a big supporter of camps and someone who, who uh, helped create that, uh, that entity. Uh, they've worked on the diversification of the aerospace industry into uh, medical devices. And uh, they've been working really hard to get PPE out there right now from a lot of their manufacturing base. They had 500 manufacturers in the state raise their hands and say they want to produce PPE. Um, they've actually have a surplus and they're just trying to figure out how to get some of the surplus of their PPE into the hands of other businesses is what um, the director there, uh, Kirk Davis, shared with me uh, earlier this week. And I, I'm gonna revisit with him on Friday to see if we can connect that up here to the Kent Chamber. Um, but uh, as we go forward, you know, one thing that we should be looking at from the federal grant money is, is how do we support efforts that continue to diversify, uh, uh, not just from commercial airplanes, but into medical devices because there's a growth market there. Um, AJAC, uh, I've already mentioned that we're working with them closely to build a pipeline of apprenticeship. I think they just had their first uh, uh, apprentice uh, uh, with Blue Origin. That's wonderful. There's, there'd be a, a, a sort of K-12 pipeline. They work really closely with Renton uh, Community Technical Education, for instance, and the K-12 program there, and that they are now placing uh, people at Blue Origin. Um, we're, we're looking to use work with them, as I mentioned, to get funding straight to the employer. Um, what are the long range prospects there? I think we continue to grow that. I think others are interested in investing in with them. 
uh, and then the revolving loan fund uh, idea, um, I, which I've covered. So, next slide. Last comment, sort of an overarching comment. Um, all the existing trends that we saw out there in the economy that I've talked to a council about, or I've talked to the Kent Chamber about, I think they, I think they're just accelerated by this whole catastrophe. Uh, I think you know changes to the supply chain, which were through the trade wars, starting to shift back uh, to mainland USA or to the other areas. That's only been hastened by this. Uh, has as is the sort of impetus to uh, buy more autom automation, buy more robotics, uh, both in manufacturing but also in, in uh, logistics companies. Um, I've already seen a lot of business recruitments for new uh, pharmaceutical and other medical supplies urgently looking to build new manufacturing uh, capacity, both in the Kent Valley, but also in the Bothell area. And uh, uh, we've also seen the devastating impact that, that this is having on uh, employment for those that are making uh, commercial airplanes. So uh, that was already sort of happening with the 737 uh, problems, but that's of course now made worse. Uh, retail, the shift to e-commerce, much stronger. Um, something that is really confusing is uh, one of the things that was really growing for a long time was restaurants. Uh, is sort of the, the way to counteract e-commerce was to have a restaurant, right? You'd go to Nordstrom's and they'd they'd be expanding their their cafe to create an experience and socializing. Well, what does that mean going forward? Um, and then uh, entertainment, tourism, business conferences are just uh, large question marks at the moment about what recovery looks like there. Uh, one thing is for certain, though, we know that the recovery is going to be uneven. Uh, certain knowledge-based industries and jobs that can be done remotely are going to do really well through this and have done really well through this. Um, we know that, for instance, the Amazon workers staying teleworking until October 2nd uh, for those who would work at South Lake Union. Um, logistics can benefit. We've seen the price for warehouses going up. We see a lot of demand still in the Industrial Valley for new speculative warehouses at the moment, although uh, there's some financing difficulties as people are nervously awaiting what June rent looks like. Uh, they are continuing to move through the entitlement process I could share and people are, are, are bullish that uh, there will be a lot of demand for warehousing still. Um, and I've covered the hospitality. Um, Kent Valley generally though, I would say, you know, on the downside risk for us, we tend to be very consumer focused. We do a lot of shipping. So if the, if the 38 million unemployed don't get rehired, soon enough and we're in a long recession period, we have a lot of wholesalers that depend on the American consumer. So, and Kent Valley, unlike a lot of parts of the country is, is very exposed to global trade. So if global trade is retrenching, maybe there's a boost right now, but over the long run, uh, that could really come back to bite us. And I, I will say, I'll now add to that because I wrote this presentation before then, uh, Blue Origins contract uh, with the federal government to build a new lunar lander $579 million. I mean, it proves sort of the recessionary proof nature of that outer space growth story. So that's really exciting for us uh, and having that growth story. Now. But there's a lot of other factors here. There's a lot of small mom and pop businesses that are desperately hurting. Those with the less savings, going back to my beginning of my presentation, uh, we've seen the food bank demand soar. Um, so there's no sugarcoating the difficulty that we have. Um, the optimistic thing I would want to end on, though, is that we have seen that those who have um, taken the right steps early enough, those places did better in their economic recovery compared to other cities. So um, pandemics do depress the economy, but those cities and places that do a better job of managing that recover faster. And uh, Seattle and the Washington area and Kent and King County have uh, done better at this than other regions. So we would, we should expect to be comparatively better than uh, other parts of the country going forward. So that's my optimistic uh, ending note. With that, and in my presentation. Bill, thank you so much for that. And I know that we're going to have time for questions, but before we go there, um, I had a really great conversation with Dr. Johnson from Green River at the beginning of the week. And um, I would like to ask if she wants to maybe tell us a few things that Green River is doing on the restarting of the economy front, as far as um, some of those retraining programs and, and how things are, you're, you're gearing those kind of things up. Um, sure. 
I, I'd be happy to say just a couple things. Um, Bill uh, actually already referenced um, some conversations that uh, Green River has been having with um, his office. And of course, uh, Mayor Ralph and I have had some communications related to potential partnerships in the context of um, academic development assistance grants. Um, so I'm sure all of you are keeping track of all the the potential legislation that's coming federally. And of course, it all makes a great deal of sense if we don't get further federal assistance, um, Washington State, in our ability to resolve um, the revenue shortfalls and the economic impact um, will be very prolonged and, and severe. And I know none of us want to go down those roads. So um, I know he, Bill is keeping close tabs on a number of, of items. We are too. Um, the EDA um, grants are something of interest. Of course, we also know that there's a HEROES Act um, being uh, vetted uh, in the House uh, back in DC, as is uh, a bill that's uh, entitled Relaunching America's Workforce, which we're watching quite a bit, because that too has elements that both support Green River College's career and technical education programs, as well as uh, business apprenticeship and so on that immediately relates to um, the city of Canton, the cities in our service area. So um, we are looking for um, and watching for all kinds of opportunities for the college, but also the college's ability to partner with the city in terms of the economic recovery. I mean, in general, I think it's a, a no brainer that you all know that Green River is part of any city's recovery in the context of continuing to be the, the best education choice for anyone who's been displaced, unemployed, or because of this disruption has, has been rethinking what their career path might be, especially when you look at Bill's data around um, retail, hospitality, and so on. And, the, and I, I, I I'm really appreciative of his slides because this acceleration of automation is going to happen. It was already happening, but I think he's spot on in terms of how rapidly the automation is going to occur in terms of business industry. What that means is there are whole large swatches of individual residents that live in the city of Kent um, that are even more vulnerable to unemployment and being automated out of jobs. So uh, Green River is watching this very carefully in these meetings. Um, are so important and informative to us to kind of anticipate what business and industries needs and what are our um, neighbors needs in terms of being members of city of Kent and living in this community. What are our neighbors going to need moving forward in terms of the recovery and whatever the new economies are. So um, I guess I'll just tick off a, a short list here. Um, one is we're looking for uh, and watching for and, and sharing out when we see things. I know the city of Kent is doing the same whenever there are partnership opportunities for granting that can bring money into the city of Kent that helps um, small businesses, employees, and potential um, people who might come here for career and technical training and education, um, we're gonna pursue that. The other is just as an FYI for all of you, Green River College, uh, along with other technical and community colleges in our state, have been given approval by the governor to resume our career technical education programs. These are all fitting underneath the uh, meaning face-to-face. -face. I mean, we've been uh, open and doing our online education and everything, but we were given uh, permission in this phase one of reopening to have a very select um, set of programs that are equipment dependent learning um, to resume face-to-face -face with uh, all the accordingly um, uh, safety procedures. And these are all connected to essential workforce in our state. That's why that's the case. And so uh, starting up on June 1, we will be resuming our nursing, our phlebotomy, and our uh, physical therapy uh, assistant programs in terms of face-to-face. -face. And of course, all of those are in high demand. Um, during the month of June, we will also be resuming our automotive or advanced manufacturing, um, our uh, welding, and carpentry construction, again, for those same purposes. Um, we are, and I know that uh, I see Calvin here. Calvin and I have a conversation coming up on our calendars um, because one of the greatest things we're concerned about, and I know that all the superintendents of schools are as well in the state of Washington, and this matters in terms of Kent's vibrancy as a, as a, uh, a growing economy, um, you know, we've always had what we call a leaky pipeline, meaning there's a huge percentage of students, once they finish high school, they don't continue on 
to um, college, whether it's Green River or something else. What we're concerned about with these added stressors is that this leaky pi pipeline will become a flood and we'll have a huge percentage of students and their families contemplating postponing any further education. And um, in fact, all the states, all the national surveys indicate that a lot of seniors and their families are thinking that their education is going to be postponed. And I know that we're going to be working with uh, Dr. Watts in the Kent school system, as we are with uh, Alan in, in the Auburn school system, to keep that pipeline uh, leak free as best as possible, whether it's Green River or something else. These students must continue on, whether it's uh, additional training for the, the employees that you all need in the city of Kent, or whether it's further education or a combination of those. So we are actively um, working on partnerships with the city of Kent, uh, as well as the city of Auburn. And I just want to put a shout out to all of you. If there's anything that you're needing, and I know we have a great dean that works in our branch locations, Tian Chang. Um, she's got a huge and strong business um, background and is our branch locations dean. And that's why Bill uh, mentioned her several times. Please reach out and let us know how we can assist. We know that we're an essential partner to the city's recovery. And we're just trying to stay in the conversations to assess the needs um, so we can better better work toward um, a rapid recovery. I like the, um, I like the V um, in recovery uh, in terms of all the letter options that Bill laid out. I'm sure we all do. Um, and I know uh, I see Jeff there too, and I know I'm going to be part of a, an upcoming Covington uh, uh, event uh, that Tyen is involved with as well. So um, if there's anything in particular, uh, Mayor Ralph, that you wanted me to say other than, than these things, I'm happy to, but um, I'm grateful to be part of the conversation today. And I'm also glad to see all of you in person. It's nice to see people other than myself and the people I live with. I mean, they're lovely people, but I'm, I'm getting a little tired of those few faces. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's exactly, I just, um, I think it's important for people to understand, for our businesses to understand we're moving, um, we're moving forward, trying to figure out what, what the future looks like. And a, a significant part of that is making sure that um, we have a educated workforce to fill the jobs as, as they start to come back online and the changing jobs, because things are not going to be the same um, when, and, and hopefully it is that V, but when we start going up the side of that, right, it's going to be very different. So I thought it was important for people to know um, all the work that you're doing. And it just, again, highlights the partnerships. You heard Bill talk about it a lot. Um, and Michelle, that at the city, we are really trying to make sure we're working to bring um, all of the, the resources out there, uh, make them available to our businesses and, and partnerships are where our strengths are. Um, there's not any single organization, city, college, business um, that that can do this alone. So I think it was just important to, to um, highlight those partnerships. Yeah, no, th thank you for, for allowing me a little time. I, I'll add one other thing. Um, Green River, uh, along with a few other community colleges in the state, have been endorsed by the state as um, a, uh, an adult re-engagement institution. And so there has been a huge surge in wanting to get that word out. And I know, and Bill, Bill and I know, we've talked about this quite a lot. Kent is an area where we've got a lot of students that have some college, but no completed degree. And so um, we'll be pushing hard uh, into the fall. Now that all of our education is online at the moment, um, we can offer every program um, and any um, interest in completion that our adult um, employed people out there might have. And that's going to be especially important for our displaced and unemployed um, employees. So I'm looking forward to, I mean, despite the, the pandemic, um, right, I'm, I'm being reminded that there's always opportunities in crisis. And this isn't something that any of us wanted to ever personally experience or have to um, support uh, recovery through for so, so many millions. Um, but there are opportunities here. So let's, I'm, I'm focusing on, on those as compared to uh, the, the challenge that we're facing at the moment. Nice, thank you. Zenobia, back to you. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> of course I am, there we go. I can see All you right, talking. So, yes. <laughs> All right, so just wanted to say thank you on the behalf of the business community. We know that you guys are working diligently to make sure that we can recover as a community. Uh, we did have a few questions though. Uh, so there has been some information or we received information. You guys touched on it a little bit about the $3.8 million available to the city 
via the CARES Act. And so we're, the question is, does the city have a plan as to how the money will be allocated to assist businesses, uh, specifically what assistance will be available to local businesses in regards to tax payment deferments or reduction in permit fees, et cetera? Um, so it sounds like there's a couple of things going on in that question um, that are that are all related to what what expenses are, but not related to each other. So we are working with individual business owners on things like their B&O tax payments. And so if there's a, a question about that, I do um, urge business owners to reach out directly to our finance department and we can work through that. Um, as far as the disbursement of that CARES money, Bill, um, I will turn it over to him for more details, but we, we got the paperwork from the state to start the process last night at like five o'clock. So um, he's been working on how we, we push that out. Bill, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Oh, you're on mute too. I'm sorry, am I off? There we go. No, it says you're muted by host. Uh, am I Okay, You're good. so uh, as I was about to say, um, <laughs> no worries. Uh, as I was about to say, I, yeah, we, we just got the funding yesterday um, in anticipation of that, but not knowing exactly how much would be available specifically for business assistance. I'm assuming it's a portion of that. Uh, I've been sorting out what are the options legally and what are some of the things that other cities are looking at. Um, there's a variety of different creative ideas out there, things from uh, uh, buying PPE for businesses that are reopening to hiring architects to redesign restaurants. But frankly, I think going back to the early slide I had about cash reserves and the early identified needs from the uh, survey, cash in hand, is there's no substitute for. Um, then you have a lot of questions about uh, spreading the peanut butter versus being acute in your intervention. What is the appropriate dollar amount? Uh, there's been a lot of discussions amongst at the city man, uh, city economic development manager level about those types of uh, things, but I think the balancing, uh, trying to overthink some of that versus the uh, exigency of getting that out the door, the urgency of that uh, as soon as we received it. So uh, we just received it yesterday. I don't have a new timeline for you. I would say that it's a, quite a big undertaking, as I alluded to, uh, from those other experiences. But there is a path out there, and uh, I think our, 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 we'd be wise to, to, to learn from those and uh, uh, try to you know, not reinvent the wheel too much, but, but draw a few lessons and, and, and proceed from there. I think the, the, ideally, we'd want to focus on those smaller businesses that are most impacted, so those uh, with fewer than 10 employees and uh, those maybe personal services, retail, restaurant, uh, for a large portion of the funding, um, although there is uh, uh, some of the funding that you might want to consider towards recovering the base of our economy, which is our manufacturing base, and getting some workers rehired sooner. Um, so we're trying to, we're working, do we have a, I don't have a formal plan to announce today, but I will say that we are in the planning stage. <laughs> okay, thank you. Is there an opportunity for the business community to be represented at the table when those decisions are being made, or is that all more going to be on just an economic development manager level? Uh, you know, that's a great question and something we're talking about. Uh, that's one of the things we're talking about is what is the appropriate level of input, right? Uh, given uh, the need to go fast. And I think for my part, I haven't tried to engage too deeply on the eligibility considerations as I have been trying to find um, capacity to actually do it when we had the funding. And uh, uh, once we have the capacity, I think we can ask interesting questions, but I think uh, of how to redo versus other cities and then consult, of course, with uh, the business community about that. But um, I'd want to present the options of what others have already done rather than try to start from scratch on the conversation, I think, in the urgency. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, you know, Kent being one of the most diverse cities in the U.S., I think it's important that we also talk about um, equity in the funding, and I know we're looking at uh, modeling other cities, but just keeping in mind, are there any procedures or best practices that the city uses to ensure that that money will be distributed in an equitable in an equitable way? Sure. I would say that all the CDFIs that we, I referenced, they have a very large equity focus in what they do, and having outreach in a way that uh, enables you to I think one of the barriers at the SBA is just 
I mean, simple translation services. And so a lot of the CDFIs that we're already talking about have multiple language uh, uh, translators available to them already on, on staff. Um, having equity as part of the prioritization <clears throat> is a very normal thing uh, that, you know, for instance, I've been looking at what Prosper Portland did in Oregon, and that was a, a huge consideration in terms of their awards. But if we do also then structure it based upon industry, who's most exposed to the governor's orders and uh, who is most exposed to the essential, and, and we have the grant awards small enough to spread over enough businesses, those are some of the things that we're looking at. So um, I've been sort of in fact-finding mode and talking to other people and see what they're thinking. And uh, I think it's been premature until we had a sense of what the capacity was and what the amount of dollars were to get too far along in sort of that exercise. But I'm um, happy to share what we found on that. And uh, uh, yeah, I think the equity consideration is really important because I think a lot of our minority owned businesses or cultural community businesses are, are clearly going to be left out of this SBA discussion. Yes. And I think the biggest thing at this point is um, what we can say is stay tuned. Um, like I said, the the grant paperwork came across my desk late yesterday afternoon. So we've got to, um, we're doing a rush to get it through council as it's their role to accept grants. Um, I will pro provide the recommendation um, that we have a significant set aside for the business community um, and council should uh, be taking action on that soon. And then um, Bill and Michelle will continue working out the details on how, how we can um, push that money out and, and have the, the greatest impact with the limited dollars that we have. Thank you. Okay. Were there any questions uh, that anyone had? I didn't receive any in the chat. And I know Scott is on the other line there with Facebook. Do we have any questions coming directly from Facebook? Scott? Sure, I can read them. Uh, stand by. Uh, somebody wanted to know if you'll be talking about the plan for parks and rec. That may have already been addressed, though. It's, that uh, was addressed. Yeah, I think that that it that will be um, not able to, as a result of the stay home, stay healthy order, be able to provide that summer programming. Okay. Uh, another one from Facebook. Some years back, the city council passed an ordinance to require the city to use Kent businesses for services or purchases first whenever possible. When not possible, staff was to give explanation as to why Kent business wasn't used. And this question, uh, questioner is wondering if, is that program still being used? Is now a time to focus on that even more so we support local as much as possible? That program is still being used and actually um, re reinforced prior to this. So um, our goal is to always support our local businesses. Okay. Uh, another question, uh, is there an effort to get some sort of lead time to when we will be allowed to reopen? Seven to 10 days will be helpful as there is work to be done to prepare to reopen. I would love to have a, an answer to that question. Um, I, the, at, at the city level, um, I am on a weekly call with the governor's office, but that does not provide us with any advance notice on the decision-making process, unfortunately. So we are sort of all in this together, scrambling. Um, and and every that's the the biggest challenge with all of this is you know when is the trigger going to be pulled on on a particular industry what requirements are going to be there and and things are changing um, they're not even changing daily I think they're changing hourly there was going to be a, a press conference at 11:30 around um, religious organizations and churches reopening and at 11:15 it got canceled so there's just there's a lot of moving pieces um, I am committed to any information that I would possibly get um, pushing out, but really at this point, we tend to be in the same, uh, we're learning things from press conferences. Okay, that's it so far from Facebook. Okay, I see a, a question um, here about CARES money going to support nonprofits providing um, to feed people. Separate buckets of money there. Um, we will continue to work with organizations on making sure that we're funneling money there. Um, some of that um, through maybe the CBDG dollars um, and then directly from the CARES Act um, money. So the city of Kent doesn't get any of that money um, directly. It goes from the federal government to the state. The city of Seattle, because they are a, a 500,000 and above population, got direct funding. And I think that's caused 
I know that's caused some confusion um, on, and I get those questions. Well, how come the city is not doing anything? We have not been included in any of that, um, that aid from the federal government to this point. So the money that we are getting now is actually come um, through the state. So we are gonna continue, I mean, I had talked about a conversation with um, Congressman Smith earlier. That was my biggest ask was um, that as the federal government's making these further decisions that they, they understand that cities um, are a great resource or way to funnel money into communities. And, and just because we don't have a population of 500,000 and above doesn't mean we don't have need. Okay. Um, I also see a question there about the money coming from King County. Uh, we are in direct conversation with um, King County, so that's a little bit of a tricky situation. The council allocated money, and there's not a lot of structure behind it. So the now the um, the finance arm of King County government is working on what that looks like as far as distribution and rules and criteria. It um, came out of King County Council last week with not a lot of structure, and so we don't have the answers to those questions as of yet. There was something in the chat about, want to talk about prevention. And so um, Val, I'll need you to expound on that question. What do you mean talk about prevention? Well, we still have the problem that people are running around without face masks and uh, we're getting assaulted in the store. And if that continues to happen, we're gonna close the store, you got more unemployment. The whole thing was preventable. I mean, I told everybody in January and February and March that Wuhan, that I'm well connected to because of relatives, uses face masks. And we're gonna have a second wave in August and probably a third wave in December if we don't watch out. Now I want all businesses to open and all businesses could open if 70, you know, if everybody wears face masks, both customers and employees, it prevents 70% of the infection rate that's all we need to do. Awesome. So is your question more related to, is the city going to mandate mask or what's your specific no, this, So this, the city of, of um, Kenmore, you know, came out with a statement that essentially said, hey, you all need to wear face masks. You know, any support we can get would get rid of some of those people that run around and saying, oh, it's my liberty. Give me liberty or death. Oh, it's just the flu you know, and all this crap that we're hearing, it's not just the flu. So you'd like the city to make a statement in regard to asking residents to wear a mask because wearing a mask could potentially prevent the spread and we could open quicker, is that your ask? CDC says it prevents the spread. It doesn't protect you from getting it, but it prevents the spread, right? And if nobody would spread it, you don't have a virus. You don't have a shutdown. So the city of Kent um, is under the direction of King County Public Health, and they have issued that request. Um, it, it is a request. Uh, there is not an enforcement side of that. And we will continue to um, work with the county on pushing that message out. OK. Thank you. OK. So that's really um, all the questions we have. Again, the, the business community is so appreciative of uh, the work that you're doing. I know that we have a few people on the line today that I think it's important to hear from them. We talked a little bit about human services. I mean, and we all know with the unemployment rate, the way that it is, uh, you know, there are uh, people uh, or organizations on the ground doing the work. And so I do want to give some uh, opportunity for Brenda Farwell to be able to speak about what uh, the human services committee um, uh, community is doing to assist with that. And then while we have Dr. Watts on the phone, I would like to get uh, like a high level overview of the school district and what's going on there. So when you are able, Dr. Watts, can you go ahead and give us an overview? Thank you uh, again for uh, hosting this uh, incredibly informative uh, event to city of Kent, uh, to uh, mayor and officials and supporting cast uh, we can't do this work by ourselves. We know that. And one of the areas that, that we're sharing in, in uh, Kent School District is this reality. Uh, if, if it had ever been questioned 
the impact of public education in this country uh, that it can have or should have on a community. Now it is, uh, it is, it is clearly uh, uh, obvious. Now, we have been asked uh, by our governor, by our state uh, superintendent, Reichdahl, to do no harm. And by doing no harm, we want to make sure that we're providing resources uh, to support the needs, especially our core business of teaching and learning. What does that mean? That means that we are providing meal service. Uh, just to give you a high level of view, we have and continue to serve breakfast and lunch. We will not be serving uh, meals. And we, we push that communication out uh, over Memorial Day holiday, uh, but we will continue to serve meals, breakfast and lunch. Uh, 18 to now 20 sites. Uh, we have partnered with uh, outside agencies and to date from March 17th, which marked mark the first day that we were serving meals to May 18th, we have served uh, 478,862 meals to our children in Kent School District. Uh, we have also been charged with providing childcare to our first responders. That includes our health care providers, our essential workers, uh, we've partnered with our YMCA of uh, Kent and Auburn. And from as of May 3rd to the 9th, uh, we have provided opportunities for 132 children to be uh, taken care of so that their families can go to work and remain gainfully employed as was made painfully uh, and uh, painfully obvious uh, of the need to, to remain gainfully employed. Uh, as we uh, are in this current state, no Kent School District staff members are providing child care services. These are all uh, due to partnerships with champions, uh, again, with the, the YMCA and local agencies. Our core business of teaching and learning certainly does not take a back seat. Since uh, the closure began March 16th, we have continued uh, to provide uh, differentiated instruction, accessibility, uh, we provided what, what we now know, and I think people have often said that uh, we're all in the same boat in this, this current crisis, and that is not exactly true. What we've learned is that we're all on the same sea, but we are all in different boats. And the, the as Nova, you mentioned equity, uh, one of our core values, uh, which is doing our best to provide the needs to, to those who need it when they need it. And we've learned that those needs are, are disparate. And so, Right now, we're in the process of uh, wrapping up, if you will, our, our school year. We will be uh, ending the school year on June 19th, uh, and we have these data to support. What have we needed in order to make this happen? We've needed technology. Uh, fortunately, through the voter-approved tech levies, we thank our voting public to support our infrastructure, uh, not only our, as well as our digital devices. Uh, we now have access and provided access so our elementary school students have their digital devices at home, as Mayor Wagner uh, mentioned earlier. For approximately 13% of our Kent School District students who do not have broadband access, we've provided uh, some barrier breakers and we've also partnered with uh, local businesses to provide hotspots uh, for our, our students. So including smartphone data plans, we've assessed that 99% of our students have access to internet uh, but that's only through, uh, at, at the very least, through a smartphone data plan. Our goal is to make sure that they have broadband access. Uh, we're working to expand that those offerings. Our technology device, uh, again, is, is upwards of 90% for our elementary, 97% access for our middle school, and 100% for our high school uh, students. And it goes without saying, I'm not, certainly not lost on me that the important uh, culmination of a K-12 environment is our graduation. And I've, I'll be sharing, I've been working very closely with uh, our communications department, with our high school principals and academy principals, listening to feedback from thought exchange and surveys sent to our students and families. I will be sharing this uh, information by Tuesday of this next week of decision on how we are going to celebrate our senior class. And we have given our current mandates. Uh, what we're not capable of, of doing, obviously, is having an in-person graduation uh, as we normally would do in a, in a traditional graduation. We will have options uh, that will be made available, uh, and I will be sharing that uh, as soon as is humanly possible, waiting for additional feedback from our, our students and our staff and our families. Uh, 
That said, these are incredibly challenging times. Uh, I think we're, we're defined by how we lead in the most challenging of circumstances. I am certainly honored to, to serve uh, in this role. And I know that I could not do this as well or at all without the support of a tremendous cast of team members of our board, uh, of our staff, and, and our partners, uh, all of you who are uh, on this call today. So I look forward to sharing more uh, in detail. I know we have an education uh, focused uh, meeting coming soon, but that, uh, that concludes my high level report. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So Brenda, if you are on the line, uh, now would be a good time for you to maybe give a high level overview of what's going on in the um, community as it relates to uh, folks who are experiencing uh, housing and food insecurities. Um, yes, uh, there's a number of people that I, I recognize on the line today and many of you are on our bi-weekly calls. So the Kent Community Foundation has been hosting um, uh, calls twice a week to include service clubs and um, organizations, including nonprofits. And um, probably our main focus has been food distribution at this point, um, just because that seems to be, um, you know, the first thing that needs to be taken care of. But I think uh, the next wave is going to be uh, making sure that families um, uh, can keep their housing, don't have to be rehoused. And so what, what's happened is the uh, group that is on the calls, we have a range of 20 to 25 people that come on the calls and then really just exchange what's happening in, in terms of food distribution, trying to determine where the supplies are coming from and seeing if we can't um, uh, make sure that everybody has access to um, whatever is coming in. For instance, we have the USDA uh, boxes coming in uh, starting this week. And um, I think that uh, through our group that we've got well over 3000 boxes that are being distributed to families. Uh, in addition to what the school district is doing, I think they're, they're uh, more than matching that amount as well. So just finding avenues for uh, supporting our families in need uh, through the conversations that we have on our bi-weekly bi calls. I think it's been uh, amazing to watch the, um, the collaborative efforts that have taken place as a result of these conversations. Uh, the Kent Food Bank, um, World Relief, uh, We Love Kent, uh, Living Well Kent, all sharing resources to make sure that they're all getting, uh, yeah, kind of maximizing the distribution. It's been in incredible to watch. I mean, uh, just a whole new level of, um, collaboration and um, looking, uh, kind of taking that broad view on getting the job done and supporting our residents. So, um, and then reaching beyond our borders. Um, the uh, Pacific Coast boxes, the USDA boxes that are, are being provided that started this week and it, we understand it goes to at least June 30th making sure that we get as many of those boxes out to our Kent residents, but also supporting Renton and Auburn, Covington and Maple Valley. So um, I know that um, we'd love to uh, continue to collaborate. Um, we have a, for instance, the Kent, uh, or the Kent Community Foundation has their scholarship event coming up and I think it would be really interesting to have conversations about um, making sure that we're, we're letting our students know what the options are for um, uh, ed education locally, because I think that's going to change for many students. They may have committed to a, um, uh, a college across, across the country and that may not be realistic for them now. So. Lots of opportunity for collaboration and couldn't be more appreciative of all the wonderful things that are being done by the organizations in our community. Awesome, thank you. And then the food drive, I saw something in the chat about the food drive. 
Yes, we have uh, another food drive coming up. Thank you, Zenobia. Uh, on oh, uh, Cynthia. <laughs> on June 13th, and um, that'll be at Kent Station. Um, and then all, all those um, items get distributed out to the uh, organizations that have uh, distribution points in place. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so um, again, I'd just like to say thank you to Mayor Ralph, Bill Ellis, uh, Michelle Wilmot for this much needed update. Uh, we definitely appreciate you and look forward to collaborating on the recovery plan. Uh, and then also thank you to everyone else who has joined the call today. I think this is a very important conversation and I know that there are probably three other Zoom meetings that you could be on at this time. So we appreciate you uh, chiming in to the conversation. Uh, our goal at the chamber is really to be a resource. So my hope is that you're able to walk away today with some valuable information. And I just wanna remind everyone on the call that the chamber has two series of meetings. One is COVID-19, a conversation with fill in the blank, right? And so the next conversation will be about education. And that would include technical college, community college, universities, and K through 12 leaders. So um, I would urge you to also join that call. And then our other series are our business essentials, which are your QuickBooks, how do you manage in a remote environment, uh, so on and so forth. And so, um, and, and last but not least, we are creating a list of businesses locally that offer PPE and resources that'll help businesses uh, with the reopening process. So be on the lookout for that information. The last thing we wanna see at the chamber is for your phase to open and your business be allowed to open based on the directive from the governor, but you're not prepared. And so uh, we just urge you to reach out to the chamber with any of your needs or any of the other partner, any of the community partners here that can assist with that. So, um, with that being said, I appreciate your time. I want to give you back three minutes uh, in your day if uh, no one else has any questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Okay, well, you guys enjoy the rest of your day and uh, we'll see you next week for a conversation about education. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.